Chapter 2, Moses and Jesus in the Providence of Restoration The Bible contains many secrets concerning God's work of salvation. It is written, Surely the Lord God does nothing without revealing His secret to His servants, the prophets. However, without knowing the principle behind God's providence, people have been unable to discern the mysteries concealed in the Bible. The biblical account of a prophet's life is not merely a record of history. Rather, through the life course of a prophet, the Bible discloses the way for fallen people to walk. In particular, we shall examine how God set up the providential courses of Jacob and Moses as models for Jesus' course to save humankind. Section 1. The Model Courses for Bringing Satan to Submission We learned that in the providence of restoration in Isaac's family, Jacob was the central figure who laid the foundation of substance. He secured the position of Abel and labored to bring Satan to submission and fulfill the indemnity condition to remove the fallen nature. Jacob's entire course became the model course for Moses and Jesus. Jesus came to bring Satan to submission in substantial terms. Before Jesus, Moses walked a course for the subjugation of Satan that was the image of the course Jesus would walk. Still earlier, God had Jacob walk a course that was a symbolic representation of Jesus' course. Moreover, Jacob's course is the model for the course which the Israelites and all of humanity must walk to bring Satan to submission and attain the goal of the providence of restoration. 1.1. Why Jacob's course and Moses' course were set up as the models for Jesus' course. The goal of the providence of restoration is attained when human beings bring Satan to voluntary submission and become his master. They must do this by fulfilling their given portion of responsibility. Jesus, as the Messiah and the true human ancestor, came to help all people of faith bring Satan to voluntary submission. By himself, he pioneered the course to bring Satan to complete submission and has since guided people of faith to follow his example. Satan, who does not meekly surrender even before God, would by no means readily surrender to Jesus, much less to ordinary believers. Therefore, God, who takes responsibility for human beings whom he created, called upon Jacob and worked through him to show us, in symbolic form, the course for bringing Satan to submission. Moses was able to subjugate Satan by following the pattern of the model course which was revealed symbolically in Jacob's course. In his course, Moses developed this to the level of image. Similarly, by building on the pattern of Moses' course, Jesus came to substantially bring Satan to submission. By walking in Jesus' footsteps, people of faith can also bring Satan to submission and master him. When Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet from your brethren, as he raised me up, you shall listen to him in whatever he tells you. He was referring to Jesus. Jesus would stand in a position comparable to Moses and follow Moses' course as the model in order to walk the worldwide providence to restore Canaan, the kingdom of God. Jesus said, the Son can do nothing of His own accord, but only what He sees the Father doing, for whatever He does, that the Son does likewise. By this He meant that He was following the model course which God had revealed to Him through Moses. Moses thus prefigured Jesus. 1.2 Jacob's course as the model for Moses' and Jesus' courses Jacob pioneered the course to bring Satan to submission. This course takes the path opposite to the way by which Satan corrupted humanity. Moses and Jesus went through courses after the pattern of Jacob's course. Let us study these courses together in this section. 1. The first human beings should have been absolutely determined to keep God's commandment not to eat of the fruit, yet they fell at the risk of their lives when the archangel tempted them. Accordingly, for Jacob to complete the restoration of Canaan at the family level, that is, return to Canaan with his family and wealth, and there restore the foundation to receive the Messiah, he had to triumph in a fight at the risk of his life with an angel, representing Satan. Jacob was desperate to overcome this trial as he wrestled with the angel at the ford of Jabbok. He triumphed and received the name Israel. In this trial, it was God who tested Jacob by putting the angel in the position of Satan. God's purpose in doing this was not to make Jacob miserable, but to help him secure the position of Abel and complete the restoration of his family by winning the qualification to rule the angel. Furthermore, through the angel playing the leading role in the trial, the way was opened for the angelic world to be restored. In the case of Moses, before he could guide the Israelites into Canaan, and thus complete the national restoration of Canaan, he first had to overcome a life-threatening trial in which the Lord tried to kill him. 
we must understand that God gives such tests to people because he loves them. If Satan rather than God gave such tests and people were to fail, they would become Satan's prey. Similarly, Jesus had to overcome a trial before he could embark upon the worldwide restoration of Canaan, that is, to guide humanity into the kingdom of heaven on earth. He battled with Satan at the risk of his life and triumphed over him when he fasted for 40 days and was tempted in the wilderness. 2. Since our fallen nature was acquired when Satan defiled our flesh and spirit, Jacob had to fulfill a comparable condition to remove it. For this reason, to restore the position of Abel for the fulfillment of the indemnity condition to remove the fallen nature, Jacob purchased the birthright from Esau with bread and lentils, which symbolized flesh and spirit. To repeat this course in Moses' day, God fed the people with manna and quail, also symbolizing flesh and spirit, and thereby strengthened their gratitude toward him and heightened their awareness of being the chosen people. Through this provision, God wanted the people to obey Moses and fulfill the indemnity condition to remove the fallen nature on the national level. Jesus said, Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Besides confirming that he walked the model course set by Moses, Jesus meant by these verses that all fallen humanity should become one with him in flesh and spirit. By faithfully following and uniting with Jesus, who at that time stood in the position of John the Baptist, they would have fulfilled the worldwide indemnity condition to remove the fallen nature. By then devotedly attending Jesus as the Messiah, they were to restore their original nature. 3. Due to the fall, Satan defiled even the human corpse. Jacob's body was sanctified with the blessing which he had received in life. In death, the disposition of his corpse also fulfilled a condition of purification, thus the embalming took 40 days. In the case of Moses, the archangel Michael contended with the devil over the proper disposition of his body. We know that Jesus' body disappeared, to the bewilderment of the authorities, leaving an empty tomb. 4. At the fall, Satan corrupted the first human ancestors during their growing period. To restore through indemnity this defilement, God has been working to set up conditions based on certain numbers, such as the number 3, which signify the growing period. When Jacob began his journey from Haran to Canaan, there was a three-day period for the separation of Satan before Laban was notified of his absence. When Moses guided his people out of Egypt into Canaan, there was an initial period of three days. Joshua lodged at the Jordan River for three days before he crossed it. When Jesus was about to begin the worldwide spiritual course to restore Canaan, he spent three days in the tomb. Jacob had twelve sons in order to restore through indemnity in his generation, horizontally, the indemnity conditions accumulated, vertically, through the twelve generations from Noah to Jacob, which had been lost to Satan. In Moses' day, there were the twelve tribes and Jesus had twelve disciples, for similar reasons. To fulfill an indemnity condition to separate Satan from the seven days of God's creation which he had defiled, there were 70 members of Jacob's family, 70 elders in Moses' time, and Jesus' 70 followers, all of whom played central, providential roles in their respective eras. 5. A staff, which smites evil, leads the way, and provides support when one leans on it, is a symbol of the Messiah. Jacob crossed the Jordan River and entered the land of Canaan while leaning on a staff. This foreshadowed that one day fallen humanity will cross the waters of this sinful world and arrive on the shore of the ideal world by following the Messiah, smiting injustice, following his guidance and example, and depending on him. Moses guided the Israelites across the Red Sea with a staff. Jesus at his second coming will guide humanity across the turbulent waters of this fallen world to reach the shore of God's ideal with the rod of iron, symbolizing himself. 6. Eve's sin implanted the root of sin in the lineage of humankind, which bore fruit when Cain killed Abel. Since it was a mother and son who allowed Satan to enter and bear the fruit of sin, according to the principle of restoration through indemnity, a mother and son must separate from Satan through their joint efforts. Jacob could not have received the blessing and separated from Satan without his mother's devoted support and wise advice. Moses could not have escaped death and been in the position to serve God's will if not for his mother's help. Finally, Mary saved Jesus' life by fleeing with him to Egypt, escaping from King Herod who sought to kill him. 7. The central figure entrusted with God's will in the providence must return from Satan's world to God's world. This is why Jacob journeyed from Haran, the satanic world, to Canaan, and Moses journeyed from Egypt to the promised land of Canaan. After Jesus had taken refuge in Egypt shortly after his birth, he returned to Galilee. 8. 
The ultimate purpose of the providence of restoration is to eradicate Satan. Signifying this, Jacob buried the idols under an oak tree. Moses tore down the golden calf, burned it with fire, ground it to a powder, scattered the powder upon the water, and made the Israelites drink it. Jesus came to destroy this evil world by bringing Satan to submission with his words and power. Section 2. The Providence of Restoration Under the Leadership of Moses 2.1. Overview of the Providence Led by Moses The Providence of Restoration Led by Moses was built upon the foundation for the Messiah laid in Abraham's family. Nevertheless, the principle still required Moses himself to lay the foundation for the Messiah by restoring through indemnity the foundation of faith and the foundation of substance. Whenever the central figure for the providence changes, the new central figure cannot inherit the providential will without first completing a similar responsibility of his own. Furthermore, in this case, the foundation had to be laid anew because the scope of the providence had expanded from a family to a nation. As we shall see, in the providence of restoration led by Moses, the indemnity conditions required to lay these foundations were quite different than before. Moses was a central figure to restore the foundation of faith. A foundation of faith had to be laid anew to begin the course to return to the promised land of Canaan upon the conclusion of the 400 years of slavery incurred because of Abraham's mistake in his symbolic offering. Before we study how Moses established the foundation of faith, let us first examine the providential position of Moses in relation to Jesus, and then in the next section investigate how he was different from all the previous central figures who were called to lay the foundation of faith. First, Moses was put in the position representing God, acting in his stead. God told Moses that he should be as God to Aaron. He also said, See, I make you as God to Pharaoh, and Aaron your brother shall be your prophet. Second, God set up Moses to prefigure Jesus. By having Moses stand in God's position before Aaron and the Pharaoh, God set him up to prefigure Jesus, the only incarnation of God. By prefiguring Jesus, Moses pioneered the path for Jesus to one day walk. Like John the Baptist after him, Moses was to make straight the way for Jesus. As the descendant of Jacob, who had established the foundation for the Messiah, Moses could serve as a central figure in the age of the providence of restoration. In his providential path, Moses built upon the tradition and deeds of his ancestor, Jacob. Their courses served as models for the path which Jesus would later walk. Moses also stood on the foundation which Joseph had laid when he entered Egypt. Joseph's life, too, prefigured that of Jesus. As the son of Rachel, Jacob's wife representing God's side, and the younger brother of the sons of Leah, Jacob's wife representing Satan's side, Joseph stood in the position of Abel. He narrowly escaped his older brother's scheme to kill him, and when he was sold off to merchants, he entered Egypt as a slave. Yet he rose to the rank of prime minister of Egypt by the age of thirty. His brothers and father came to Egypt and humbly bowed before him, fulfilling a prophetic dream he had as a child. Based upon this providential victory, the Israelites entered Egypt and commenced a period of hardships for the purpose of severing Satan's ties. Joseph's course foreshadowed the course which Jesus would later walk. After coming to the Satanic world, Jesus would endure a path of hardships and emerge as the King of Kings at the age of 30. He was to bring all of humanity, including his forefathers, into submission, cut all their ties to the Satanic world, and restore them to God's realm. Moses' infancy, childhood, and death also prefigured the course of Jesus. At his birth, Moses was in danger of being killed at the hands of the Pharaoh. After his mother nursed him in concealment, Moses entered the Pharaoh's palace and was brought up safely among his foes. Likewise, Jesus was born into a situation where he was in danger of being killed by King Herod. Jesus' mother took him, fled to Egypt, and raised him in concealment there. Later, she brought him back to King Herod's realm, where he grew up safely among his foes. After Moses' death, no one knew the whereabouts of his body. This foreshadowed what would happen to Jesus' body after his death. In all these ways, Moses' course to restore Canaan on the national level was the model for Jesus' course to restore Canaan on the worldwide level. And, as we mentioned earlier, the Bible attests through the words of Moses and Jesus that God disclosed through Moses' life a model for Jesus, prefiguring the path Jesus would walk in the future. Moses was in a position different from earlier central figures who were entrusted with laying the foundation of faith. Unlike Abel, Noah, and Abraham, Moses did not need to make a symbolic offering. Rather, he could restore the foundation of faith merely by obedience to God's word while fulfilling a dispensation of forty for the separation of Satan. 
There are three reasons for this difference. First, Moses stood on the foundation of the three successful symbolic offerings by Abel, Noah, and Isaac. They had completed the providence based on making symbolic offerings. Second, symbolic offerings were objects for the condition made necessary as substitutes for the word, because after the first human ancestors lost God's word at the fall, people were not able to receive God's word directly. Hence, during the age of the providence to lay the foundation for restoration, the age from Adam to Abraham, sacrifices had been offered as objects for the condition in laying the foundation of faith. However, by Moses' time, that age had come to a close. Humanity had entered a new era, the age of the providence of restoration, Old Testament age, when they could once again receive God's word directly. Thus, there was no longer any need of a symbolic offering in laying the foundation of faith. Third, as the providence which had commenced with Adam's family was prolonged again and again, certain conditions of indemnity were needed to restore the providential periods which had been defiled by Satan. When Noah was laying the foundation of faith, he had to pass through a dispensation of forty for the separation of Satan while living in the ark. Abraham could make the symbolic offering to lay the foundation of faith only after he restored the previous period of four hundred years and thus stood on the foundation of a dispensation of forty for the separation of Satan. The Israelites suffered 400 years of slavery in Egypt to fulfill a dispensation of 40 for the separation of Satan and thereby restore the foundation of faith claimed by Satan due to Abraham's mistake. Likewise, in the age of the providence of restoration, a central figure could lay the foundation of faith as long as he stood firmly upon the completion of the dispensation of 40 for the separation of Satan by upholding God's word, now that an object for the condition was no longer required to serve as its substitute. In the age of the providence to lay the foundation for restoration, God worked to lay the family foundation of substance. Upon entering the age of the providence of restoration, God worked to lay the national foundation of substance. Since Moses stood as God to the people and represented Jesus, he stood in the position of parent to the Israelites when laying the national foundation of faith. Concurrently, as a prophet with the mission to prepare the way for Jesus, Moses stood in the position of a child. Therefore, with respect to the Israelites, Moses stood in the position of Abel as a central figure for the national foundation of substance. We recall that Abel made the symbolic offering from the position of a parent in Adam's stead and was thereby entitled to make the substantial offering from the position of a child. Likewise, Moses stood in the dual positions of parent and child. When he restored through indemnity the foundation of faith, he stood in the position of a parent. He thereby secured the position of Abel for the substantial offering for which he stood in the position of a child. Once Moses had secured the position of Abel, the Israelites, standing in the position of Cain, were supposed to fulfill the national indemnity condition to remove the fallen nature through their obedience to Moses. By doing so, they would establish the national foundation of substance. Moses was to restore through indemnity the national foundation of faith, and the Israelites under Moses' leadership were to restore through indemnity the national foundation of substance. This would have constituted the national foundation for the Messiah and the basis for a sovereign nation to which the Messiah could come. The Israelites were then to receive the Messiah, be reborn through him, be cleansed of their original sin, and restore their original nature by uniting with God in heart. In this way, they were to attain the ultimate goal of becoming perfect incarnations. 2.2 the national courses to restore Canaan under the leadership of Moses. Moses brought the Israelites out of Egypt, the satanic world, with miracles and signs, led them across the Red Sea, and had them wander through the wilderness before entering the promised land of Canaan. This foreshadowed the course on which Jesus would one day lead Christians, the second Israel. With miracles and signs, Jesus would bring Christians out of lives of sin and lead them safely across the troubled sea of evil. He would take them through a desert devoid of life-giving water before guiding them into the Garden of Eden of God's promise. Just as the national course to restore Canaan under the leadership of Moses was prolonged as three courses because of the Israelites' faithlessness, the worldwide course to restore Canaan under the leadership of Jesus had to be undertaken three times because of the disbelief of John the Baptist and the Jewish people of that day. To avoid redundancy, a close comparison between Moses' course and Jesus' course will not be made here. Still, the parallels will become plain when one compares this section with the next. After 400 years of slavery in Egypt, the indemnity period required of the Israelites due to Abraham's mistake came to an end. 
In order for Moses to become the central figure to restore the foundation of faith and be qualified to lead the Israelites out of Egypt, he as an individual had to inherit the 400 year national indemnity period and complete a dispensation of 40 for the separation of Satan. In addition, Moses had to restore through indemnity the number 40, which unfallen Adam should have fulfilled to establish his foundation of faith. To achieve these purposes, Moses was brought into the Pharaoh's palace, the center of the satanic world, and he spent 40 years there. While in the palace, Moses was educated by his mother, who, unknown to anyone, was hired to be his nurse. She secretly imparted to him the consciousness and pride of belonging to the chosen people. Despite the comforts of palace life, Moses maintained unshakable loyalty and fidelity to the lineage of Israel. After 40 years, he left the palace, choosing rather to share ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. Hence, during the 40 years of his life in the Pharaoh's palace, Moses fulfilled the dispensation of 40 for the separation of Satan and thereby restored the foundation of faith. Moses was in the dual position of parent and child. When he laid the foundation of faith, he also secured the position of Abel for the foundation of substance. The Israelites, who were in the position of Cain, were supposed to follow and obey Moses in faith. By inheriting God's will from Moses and multiplying goodness, they would fulfill the national indemnity condition to remove the fallen nature and lay the national foundation of substance. The Israelites were to lay the foundation of substance by following Moses from the time they left Egypt until they entered the blessed land of Canaan. God commenced the dispensation to start the course with Moses' act of killing an Egyptian. Seeing one of his brethren being mistreated by an Egyptian taskmaster, Moses was incited by his burning love for his people, he struck and killed the man. In a way, this was an expression of God's heart of burning indignation as he looked down upon the affliction of his people. At that moment, whether or not the Israelites united with Moses would determine if they could successfully begin the course to return to Canaan. When Moses killed the Egyptian, God used this act to achieve the following. First, the archangel induced the first human ancestors to fall and Cain to kill Abel. These were the conditions by which Satan has controlled the progression of sinful history from the position of the eldest son. Therefore, before God could begin the providence to restore Canaan, someone on God's side should fulfill the condition to restore this through indemnity by prevailing over someone on the side of Satan who stands in the position of the eldest son. Second, this act effectively cut off any lingering attachment Moses had to the Pharaoh's palace and placed him in a situation where he could never return. Finally, by this act, God desired to induce the Israelites to trust Moses by showing them he was a patriotic Israelite. As we shall see, these were comparable to the reasons why in the second national course to restore Canaan, God struck all the firstborn among the Egyptians and their livestock. The Israelites, upon witnessing Moses' act of killing the Egyptian, should have been deeply inspired by his love for Israel, as was God. Had they felt this way, they would have respected Moses, trusted him, and followed him with ardor. Then, through Moses' leadership, God would have brought them directly into the land of Canaan, where they would have established the foundation of substance. In fact, they would not have had to cross the Red Sea or wander through the Sinai wilderness, but would have taken the straight route to Canaan by way of the land of the Philistines. In a 21-day course, they would have restored Jacob's 21 years in Haran. Later, in the second national course, God had reason to distrust the Israelites because their previous failure to follow Moses had aborted the first national course. It is written, When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near, for God said, Lest the people repent when they see war, and return to Egypt. During the second national course to restore Canaan, God led the people across the Red Sea and in a detour through the wilderness, because he had reason to fear they might turn faithless and return to Egypt without completing their journey. Had the Israelites, Cain, wholeheartedly obeyed Moses, Abel, and followed him to return to Canaan, they would have fulfilled the national indemnity condition to remove the fallen nature and laid the foundation of substance. On the contrary, however, when they saw Moses strike and kill the Egyptian, they misunderstood him and spoke ill of him. When he went out the next day, behold, two Hebrews were struggling together, and he said to the man that did the wrong, Why did you strike your fellow? He answered, Who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, Surely the thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. Moses was left with no choice but to escape from the Pharaoh. Reluctantly forsaking the Israelites, he fled into the wilderness of Midian. 
the foundation of substance was shattered, and the Israelites' course to restore Canaan under the leadership of Moses would be repeated a second, and eventually a third time. When the first national course to restore Canaan ended in failure due to the disbelief of the Israelites, Satan claimed the forty years of Moses' life in Pharaoh's palace, during which he had laid the foundation of faith. Hence, for Moses to begin the second national course to restore Canaan, he had to lay anew the foundation of faith by completing another period of forty years to restore through indemnity his lost forty years in the palace. This was the purpose of Moses' forty-year exile in the wilderness of Midian. During this forty-year period, the Israelites' lives in Egypt became even more miserable as the penalty for their disbelief in Moses. Moses went through a second dispensation of forty for the separation of Satan during the forty years he spent in the wilderness of Midian. There he restored the foundation of faith needed to embark upon the second national course to restore Canaan. God then appeared before Moses and said, I have seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring forth my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. Once Moses restored the foundation of faith in the wilderness of Midian, he also secured the position of Abel. Accordingly, as in the first national course to restore Canaan, if the Israelite people in the position of Cain had believed in and followed Moses with unquestioning faith and obedience, they would have entered the promised land, the land of milk and honey. In so doing, they would have fulfilled the indemnity condition to remove the fallen nature and laid the foundation of substance. God worked the dispensation to start the first national course to restore Canaan when Moses struck and killed an Egyptian. Similarly, to work the dispensation to start the second national course to restore Canaan, God granted Moses three signs and ten plagues with which to prevail over the Egyptians. The reasons God had Moses strike the satanic side were, as already elucidated, first, to restore through indemnity the position of the eldest son which Satan had defiled, second, to cut off the Israelites' attachment to Egypt, third, to let the Israelites know that Moses was sent by God. There was yet another reason why Moses could strike the Egyptians. Although the Israelites had already completed the due indemnity period of 400 years as slaves in Egypt, they had suffered 30 additional years of affliction. God heard their cries and groaning and answered them with compassion. The three signs which God provided for Moses and Aaron to perform foreshadowed the work of Jesus. The first sign was given when God commanded Moses to cast down his staff, and it became a serpent. When Aaron later performed this sign before the Pharaoh at Moses' command, the Pharaoh summoned his magicians and had them cast down their staffs, which also became serpents, but Aaron's serpent devoured their serpents. This sign symbolically foreshadowed that Jesus would come as the Savior and destroy the satanic world. The staff symbolized Jesus. Just as the staff displayed miraculous power in front of Moses, who represented God, Jesus was to come with such power and perform miracles before God himself. Moreover, a staff provides protection and support for people to lean on. It smites injustice and leads people on the right path. Symbolizing Jesus, Moses' staff disclosed the missions which Jesus was to accomplish at his coming. The transformation of Moses' staff into a serpent also symbolized the work of Jesus. Jesus likened himself to a serpent, saying, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. He also said to his disciples, Be wise as serpents. Jesus meant by this saying that he came as the good serpent of wisdom who entices and leads fallen people on the path of goodness. He was thus to restore through indemnity the fall caused by the evil serpent who cunningly tempted the first human ancestors. Therefore his disciples were to learn Jesus' wisdom and guide the sinful people in the way of goodness. Moreover, when Moses' serpent devoured the magician's serpents, it signified that Jesus would come as the heavenly serpent to swallow up and destroy Satan, the evil serpent. The second sign was given when Moses, upon God's command, put his hand into his bosom and it became leprous. Then God commanded him to put his hand into his bosom a second time and it was healed. This miracle foreshadowed symbolically that Jesus would come as the second Adam and, together with his would-be bride, the second Eve later manifested in the Holy Spirit, perform the work of redemption. 
The first time Moses put his hand into his bosom and it became leprous symbolized the archangel embracing Eve to his bosom, an act which tainted humanity with incurable sin. The second time Moses put his hand into his bosom and it was healed foreshadowed that Jesus, the true father, would come and restore his bride, the true mother, and that they would embrace humanity to give them rebirth as a hen gathers her brood under her wings. Restoration would then be complete. To perform the third sign, God instructed Moses to pour water from the Nile on the ground and it would turn to blood. The symbolism of this sign lies in water, an inorganic substance, being transformed into blood, a substance of life. Water is a biblical symbol for the fallen multitudes who have no life in them. Thus, this sign foreshadowed that Jesus and the Holy Spirit would come and resurrect fallen humanity, deprived of life, to become the living children of God. God had Moses and Aaron perform these three signs in order to fulfill symbolic indemnity conditions upon which Jesus and the Holy Spirit would later come to Israel as the true parents. They would restore the original four-position foundation which had been lost to Satan and give rebirth to all humanity as their children.